So chapter 19 is electrochemistry, which is building off of the redox reactions that we learned about back in chapter 4. So brief recap of what redox reactions are. Do, 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 do. So when I say redox, these are coupled reactions. Coupled, part of it's a reduction, part of it is an oxidation. Yes? You can log in. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't tried it today. So the reduction part of it is the gaining of electrons. So gaining electrons is reduction, which sounds kind of confusing. Why are you being reduced if you're gaining something? But even though you're gaining electrons, what is going down as you gain electrons? the charge, or if you're not a charged particle, at least your oxidation number is being reduced. That's why it's called reduction. While losing electrons is the oxidation. So we had a couple of different ways of remembering this. There was the famous Leo, the lion says, Grr, losing electrons is oxidation, gaining electrons is reduction. In the video we watched last time, there was oil rig, oxidation is losing, and reduction is gaining. So whichever way you need to remember them. We also, in chapter four, balanced redox reactions. The easiest way about going about this was when we were just dealing with metals and just looking at their net ionic reaction, meaning we were ignoring any spectator ions. So for example, let's see here. Pull an example from chapter four. See if we can remember how exactly we balance this thing. Aluminum solid plus iron two plus aqueous goes to aluminum three plus aqueous and solid iron. So by the rules of chapter three in stoichiometry and conservation of mass and all that good stuff, it's technically balanced. I start with one aluminum, I end with one aluminum. I start with one iron, I end with one iron. But it is not balanced as far as the number of electrons involved. So in redox reactions, when we balance them, we balance the number of electrons. And there were three steps to balance a simple redox reaction. Break them into the two half reactions, meaning show the half that was reduction, show the half that was an oxidation, and how many electrons were involved. Balance, so those number of electrons are the same, and then step three, add them back together. So first of all, just looking at this, if gaining electrons is reduction, meaning your charge is going to go down, which one was reduced, aluminum or iron 2 plus? Iron 2 plus, because iron 2 plus went from a charge here, dark color, 2 plus down to a charge of, it's not shown, but it's understood zero. That charge went down by doing what? What did iron do to do that? How, what? Gaining. How many electrons would have to gain to go from two plus down to zero? Two electrons. So if we were to write the reduction half reaction, doesn't matter which one you write first, oxidation or reduction. So let's write the reduction first. So the reduction half reaction would look like this. Reduction half reaction would be iron two plus gains two electrons. We're just going to ignore the states of matter for now. We'll put them back in at the end. Do, do, do. Gains two electrons, so plus two electrons. Man, that is bad today.
and becomes iron with no charge. So that is your reduction half reaction. So if iron got reduced, what got oxidized? Aluminum. Aluminum, Aluminum went from zero charge to three plus charge. We learned way back in chapter two that you gain a positive charge by losing electrons. In this case, how many electrons would aluminum have to lose? Three. So the oxidation half reaction would show starting with aluminum and you end up being aluminum three plus and it lost three electrons. So those three electrons are going to be shown as coming out on the product end there. So that was step one, write the two half reactions. Step two is balancing the electrons. Are these electrons already balanced as written? What do I mean by that? When I have a reduction, it's gaining electrons. Where are those electrons coming from? There's not just free electrons floating around out there. Where are the electrons coming from? Iron gained electrons. Who gave them the electrons? Aluminum. So oxidation reduction reactions are technically a transfer of electrons. So if they're a transfer of electrons, one thing is giving them to the other thing, that means they must be the same number of electrons shown in both half reactions because those are the electrons that are transferred. If aluminum gave up three electrons but iron only gained two, then they're not balanced. So what could we multiply this first reaction by and the second reaction by to get them balanced. Three and two, good. Because two electrons and three electrons, least common multiple of that is six. So I multiply the first equation by three and the second equation by two. Go ahead and rewrite them, distributing the three and the two. That's the second step. The last step is to add these together, canceling out any electrons that occur on opposite sides, which should be all of them if you balance them correctly in the second step. So when we add these together, those six electrons on the reactant side and the product side will cancel with each other. And then you'll just write what's left. And Add back in the states of matter. He does not like me writing states of matter, apparently. And that was the half reaction method of balancing redox reaction. Three steps. Now, the only thing I ever did to complicate this was sometimes I would put in a spectator ion. So instead of writing iron 2 plus up here, instead I might have written it this way. I might have written it as iron chloride, like that. And on the other side, I wouldn't tell you what the products are. You would have to figure out the products are. So that chlorine would go from the iron to the aluminum in the reaction. And chlorine itself would be a spectator ion. If you were to write the net ionic reaction of that, the chlorine ions would have canceled out because it wouldn't have changed air anything. It wouldn't have changed its charge. It wouldn't have changed its oxidation number. It's just a spectator. So that was as complicated as it got back in chapter four. Ready for the new redox reactions? Any questions about the old method? All right. Moving on to balancing new redox reactions here. So in a redox reaction where you're not actually seeing the charges, the way we determine what was being oxidized or reduced was by signing that oxidation number. And the oxidation number is basically, if it was ionic, what would be the charge on each atom in that molecule? So even though some of these things are ionic, not everything is. An element by itself with no charge always has an oxidation number of zero. The sum of the oxidation numbers has to add up to the oxidation state on the molecule. 
So the overall charge, if it's no charge, it has to up to zero. If it's a polyatomic ion, it has to up to the charge in that polyatomic ion. If you have something that is an ion, it's just the charge of the ion. For example, here we have potassium chlorate. Potassium, if I, this is technically an ionic compound, if we were to write it as the two separate ions here, we would have potassium plus and chlorate minus is a polyatomic ion. So potassium plus, that means it has an oxidation state of plus one. Now the chlorate ion, if I were to assign the oxidation numbers in chlorate, ClO3. Back in chapter three or four, when we were learning how to assign oxidation states, there was a table of what elements take priority. For example, the most common oxidation state of chlorine is minus one. But the most common oxidation state of oxygen is minus two, and oxygen's oxidation state rule took precedent over chlorine. So we would assign it its oxidation state first and say, okay, oxygen is minus two. I have to add up to this oxidation state or charge on the overall molecule. This is a polyatomic ion with a negative one charge here. So if I assign oxidation states to chlorine, chlorine can't be minus one because that's not going to add up to minus, or minus one overall. I have three oxygens that are minus two apiece, so that means it contributed what total towards the charge? Minus what? Six. So something plus minus six has to add up to negative one because that's the charge on our molecule. So what plus negative six gives me negative one? Five. So that means our mystery number here for chlorine must be plus five. So that's where that plus five came from. So that was the assigning oxidation states we did back in chapter four. Now when we look at it in terms of the reaction, we're not seeing charges change, but we are seeing the oxidation numbers change. Now potassium starts as plus one and in the end it's still plus one. So if it didn't change at all, what do we call that ion? I just used the term, spectator. good, spectator ion. So potassium is a spectator ion because its oxidation state did not change. Chlorine went from plus five to minus one. Is that gaining electrons or losing them? Gaining, so chlorine was reduced while what got oxidized? Oxygen. Oxygen went from negative two to zero. That is losing electrons, so that is going to be our oxidation. So in this reaction, chlorine was reduced and oxygen was oxidized. What if you can't throw a negative six off the top of um, I, I have three oxygens. Each of them are minus two, so that's a total of negative six. Okay. If you were to draw this molecule, let's just not worrying about whether or not they're single or double or triple. Each of these are minus two, minus two, minus two, so chlorine must be plus five so that overall it adds up to minus one. Yeah. Not to be confused with formal charge. That was something different we did later. All right. So as long as the oxidation state is changing, you were a redox reaction, which means some very common reactions we have seen, such as the second one here is Methane plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water. What kind of reaction is that? When something reacts with oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water, something containing carbon and hydrogen. That's a what reaction? Burning. Oxidation. That's a combustion. Combustion reaction. So combustion reactions are also redox reactions because you can see the oxidation states of both carbon and oxygen change in this reaction. All right, so let's consider this reaction. I have iron reacting with the dichromate ion. Iron reacting with the dichromate ion. And the products are iron three plus and chromate three plus. So as first blush, it just looks like a normal redox reaction except for what on earth happened to the oxygens, right? And compared to the last one we did, we didn't have anything that wasn't technically a spectator in there. We can't call oxygen a spectator ion because it is part of the polyatomic ion here. So it's going to take a few more steps to figure out how to balance this thing, because clearly it's not balanced. Now, some things to consider. 
Whenever you have a metal that is an ion, we always wrote its state of matter as aqueous. So these reactions are always going to take place in aqueous medium, which means that we've always got plenty of what molecules floating around? Water molecules. So we can use water molecules to balance this, which is great because water molecules contain oxygen. And I see a big issue right here in that oxygen is in the reaction side, but there's no oxygen on the product side. So that's great. Another thing is most of these redox reactions take place in acidic solution. So in acidic solution, what ion do we have plenty of? Acids are things that release what in solution? Hydronium. Without the H2O, though, that's just the H plus, hydrogen ion. Remember, in, equi in aqueous solution, hydrogen ion and hydronium are equivalent because it's just with or without the oxygen. So we can also add plenty of hydrogen ion to this reaction, which is great because if we're going to be adding waters. That's going to throw in a bunch of hydrogens in there so we can add hydrogen ion to balance it out. So these are the ideas behind how we can balance out this reaction. So unlike back in chapter four where there were three steps, there's going to be a few more steps. We're on page 878, and there are seven steps to balancing a redox reaction in acidic solution. Two extras, so a total of nine if it's a basic solution. So step one is still the same. Break it apart into the two half reactions. Determine what was oxidized and what was reduced. So in that reaction, if I look at the charges here, Iron went from two plus down to, or up to three plus. So that's clearly losing an electron. So that's oxidized. So even though you're not quite sure what's going on with this dichromate thing, iron was clearly oxidized, which means the dichromate must have been reduced. Now, honestly, in this reaction, or in this method, even if you're not 100% sure what is the oxidation, what is the reduction, we will figure it out later. So even if you could just break it into two halves and go, OK, something was oxidized, something was reduced, I don't know what they are. I just know these are the two halves of the reaction. We will figure it out later. So don't panic too much in that very first step and get stuck. So oxidation and reduction half reactions. That's step one. Step two is we want to balance anything that is not oxygen or hydrogen. Because oxygen and hydrogen, we can balance later with adding water molecules and hydrogen ions. So anything that is not hydrogen or oxygen gets balanced. For example, in this reaction, iron is already balanced, but chromium is not. I started with two chromiums, and I only ended with one. So I'm going to put a coefficient of two in front of the chromium in order to balance out that chromium. So that's step two, balance anything other than oxygens or hydrogens. Step three. Now we're going to balance the oxygens by adding waters. So the oxidation reaction didn't have any oxygen in it, so we're just going to leave him alone for now. But the dichromate there has seven oxygens. So if I have seven oxygens on the reactant side, I need to show that there's seven oxygens on the product side. So I'm going to add seven waters to provide those seven oxygens. And now the oxygens are balanced. But what did I mess up balancing-wise? Not mess up, but hydrogen. Now hydrogen's not balanced. Now how many hydrogens do I have on the product side? 14. So what do you think step four is going to be? To add 14 hydrogens. Remember, this is an acidic solution, so there's plenty of hydrogen ion flowing around. So step four is going to be balance the hydrogen by adding hydrogen ions to the opposite side of wherever you added water. So wherever you added water, now you have to add hydrogens to the opposite side to balance them out. Hydrogen plus ions. So that's step four. Doo -doo -doo -doo. So step one is to break them apart. Step two, balance anything other than oxygen or hydrogen. Step three, balance the oxygens by adding waters. Step four, balance the hydrogens by adding hydrogen ions. So at this point, the atoms all look balanced. So we are technically where we were at the end of the first step in the last problem. All of our atoms are balanced. But what is still not balanced here? What was not balanced? Charge, good, charge. Our electrons are not balanced. Now the problem is, the way we've written these half reactions, we don't actually see the electrons. So it's hard to figure out how to balance them. So step five is going to be showing those electrons. 
So how do you determine how many electrons to show? You do it by balancing out the charges. Now in that first reaction, the oxidation is pretty obvious because iron 2 plus down to iron 3 plus means it must have lost one electron. A little bit trickier when we have more things going on here. So what we're going to do is we're going to add up the total charge we've got. So before, let me step back one so we can look at this before we've messed up anything here. If we add up the total charge on our reactant side here, I have 14 positive charges and two negatives. So overall, what's the total charge on our reactant side? 12 positive or negative? Positive. So 12 positive is my charge on my reactant side. On my product side, water has no charge, but chromium does. So what's my total charge on my product side? There's two here. Six plus, good. Six plus, because I have two chromiums and they're each three plus. So the charges are not balanced. What's the charge on electron, positive or negative? Negative. So I need to take this 12 plus and make it 6 plus, which means I need to subtract it. I need to bring it down by 6 charge units. So to bring it down by 6 charge units, I need to add 6 electrons. So this portion, again, was going to be 12 plus. I add in those 6 electrons, so those 6 minus. Do, and that brings me down to 6 plus. So 6 mi minus plus 12 plus is where this plus 6 comes with. So now it equals the charge on our other side. So yeah, technically now we're, we're, we're at, at the end of the first step of the last problem. Don't worry, just two steps to go. Two steps, and now we are at, since we were at the end of the first step of the last method, and the last method only took three steps, the two last steps are going to do the same for both methods. So looking at these, do the electrons balance between the two different reactions? Do I have the same number of electrons in my oxidation that I do in my reduction? No, is that a problem? Yes. So step six is going to be the same as step two was the last time, balance the number of electrons. So what can I multiply by that first reaction by to balance the electrons? Six, good. So if I take that first reaction and I multiply by six, that will balance so I have the same number of electrons in both reactions. So step six is to balance the electrons by multiplying the half reactions by whatever coefficient gets them to their least common multiple. So that's step six. One more step to go. What was the last step? Combine them. Put them all back together. And what cancels out when we do that? The electrons. So there goes the six electrons and six electrons when we add them back together. And here is our balanced redox reaction. You should be completely balanced as far as the number of every atom goes. So six irons, six irons. 14 hydrogens, 14 hydrogens, 2 chromiums, 2 chromiums, 7 oxygens, 7 oxygens. You should all be completely balanced as far as the charges go. So I have, well, we won't add them up, but trust me, the charges will balance throughout as well. And that's how you know that a redox reaction is fully charged. Both the atoms and the charges on both sides balance out. <coughs> all right. You try this out. I'm going to start a blank page. Uh, keep sharp. Here. And we'll do the sample problem. All right. Uh, let's see here. Oh, that's it. Real quick. If the solution is a basic solution, I said that there were two extra steps you'd have to do to bring your total up to nine steps. Because at the end of this, I've got all these hydrogen ions, which means I'm an acidic solution. But what if I'm not an acidic solution? What if I'm basic solution? Basic solution isn't full of hydrogen ions, it's full of what ions? Hydroxide ions. 
So if you are in basic solution, the first seven steps will still be the same, but then you're going to have two extra steps, and here's the two extra steps. If you are in a base solution, you need to cancel out those hydrogen ions by adding hydroxide ions. Now here's the thing. When you are a half reaction, you can add whatever you want to balance anything to any side. But once you are a full reaction, the laws of, or of algebra come back into play, which means if you do anything to one side, you must do to the other. So at the end of step seven, because I've added these back together, I'm a full equation. So if I add hydroxide ions to one side, I must add the exact same number of hydroxide ions to the other side. Good. <laughs> So step eight is for every hydrogen ion in the reaction, you're going to add a hydroxide ion to cancel it, and you must add the same number of hydroxide ions to the other side. So if this reaction that we just balanced was a base, instead, how many hydroxide ions would I need to add to both sides? 14. So I would add 14 hydroxide ions to both sides. Now, what do you get when you add hydrogen ion to hydroxide ion? What does that add up to? Water. So how many waters did I just re produce on my reactant side? 14 waters. So I now have 14 waters. Is this reaction still balanced or something going on wrong? Is anything canceled now? seven of the waters, right? I've got seven waters over here on the product side, and I've got 14 waters over here on the reactant side. So the very last step, step nine, is to cancel out any extra waters. So these seven waters would cancel, and this would go down to just seven waters on the reactant side. So those are the last two steps, only if you're in a basic solution. And it would say right there in the question, you're in a acidic solution or you're in basic solution. I like to write out the number of steps off to the side and can't cross them out as I do them to make sure that I don't leave one out or do them out of order. So as soon as I read that question, I see the word acidic or basic, I write either seven for acidic or nine if it's basic, one through nine, and then I cross them out as I go through them just to keep track and make sure I do them in order. Because if you can imagine, if you do any of these out of order, it will not work. All right, so let's try this out. Permanganate ion, MnO4 negative, and iodide ion, I minus, react in basic solution to produce manganese oxide and molecular iodine. React, use the half reaction method to balance this equation. Now, to determine what was oxidized and what was reduced, a little bit trickier here because iodine is, well, you can kind of tell, but it looks like at first both things start out negative and both things start off with no charge. So to really determine what was oxidized and what was reduced, you can assign oxidation numbers. That's what they've done here. They've assigned oxidation numbers to everything. So looking at these oxidation numbers, the oxidized species was the one that lost electrons and therefore its charge went up. So what was oxidized? What lost electrons? Iodide, you, good. Iodide went from negative one to zero, so that is losing electrons. What was reduced, meaning its charge went down, or its oxidation number went down? Manganese, good. Manganese went from plus seven down to plus four, so that's a reduction. And oxygen in most of these reactions is going to technically be a spectator. It won't be a spectator ion because it's not an ion. It'll just be a spectator because usually its oxidation state does not change. All right. So when we write our half reactions here, I going to I2 is going to be our oxidation and the, uh, mang the um, permanganate ion going down to the manganese oxide is going to be our reduction. So let's go ahead and write those half reactions over here. And we're also told that we are in basic solution, so it's going to take nine steps. Go back to where I had base. So I'm going to write off to the side. I'll do it over here. 
1 through 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So we can cross them off as we get them done. So step one was to write those two half reactions. So the oxidation half reaction is going to be the I minus going to I2. I minus going to I2. And then the reduction is going to be that permanganate ion. The MnO4 minus going to MnO2. We don't really worry about states of matter with this. We've got enough going on as it is. So that was technically step one, right? The two half reactions, so I'm going to cross out the number one. What is step two? Balance what? Anything except for what two elements? Hydrogen and oxygen. So is anything other than hydrogen and oxygen, not balanced. Yes, iodide. So we need to put in what coefficient where? A 2. Put in a 2 right there. Let me. A 2 right there. Now is everything else balanced? Yes, so step two, done. Cross it out. What's step three? Balance, balance your oxygen. So oxygen is clearly not balanced in that reduction. I start with four oxygens, I end with two. So which side do I need to add ox waters to, and how many do I need to add? Good. If I add two waters to the product side, now I've just added two more oxygens. Added two more oxygens for a total of four oxygens on both sides. So step three done. How about step four? Now my oxygens are balanced. What still needs to be balanced? Hydrogens. Okay. So hydrogens are definitely not balanced right now. I'm going to erase this word redox so that I can have a little more space here. How many hydrogen ions do I need to add and to what side? Good. Four to the reactant side because I have four from that water. So four hydrogen ions to the reactant side. So that's step four. Cross it out. So step five is the tricky one. This is where you balance out the charges. So let's look at these charges. Let's look first at our oxidation. Our oxidation reaction here, I've got what total charge on my reactant side? Two minus. I've got I minus and I've got two of them, so that's a total of two minus. What is my total charge on my product side? Zero. Be a minus, not an E. Two minus. And that's zero. That's clearly not balanced. If I add electrons, they add negative charge. So which side should I add electrons to? The product side. Now this is an oxidation. So in an oxidation, you're losing electrons. So does it make sure, sense that electrons would be a product? Yes. How many electrons am I going to lose here? Two. Because if I lose two electrons, now my product side is not a charge of zero. It's a charge of two minus. Okay. Now let's try and do the same thing, or try. We will do. There is no try, only do. To the reduction reaction. So I've got four positives and a negative for a total of what charge on my reactant side here? Three plus. What's my total charge on my product side? Zero. 
So which side do I need to add electrons to? The left. How many do I need to add? Three. Move this thing again. Three electrons. Now again, this is a reduction, so it's gaining electrons. So we would expect the electrons to be written as a reactant. You should end up with the oxidation reaction, half reaction with electrons on the product side, the reduction reaction with electrons on the reactant side. If you don't, they can't cancel. So make sure you end up with both of them needing to add electrons and on, on two opposite sides, because that's how a reduction reaction, re, redox reaction works. So there's step five, cross it out. Do. Step six now. What do we do next? Good. Balance the electrons. So I've got two electrons in my oxidation and three in my reduction. So what am I going to multiply my oxidation by? Three. In my reduction, I will multiply by two. So I'm going to rewrite that down here. Distributing the three, I have now six I minus. goes to three I2s and six electrons. There's my oxidation reaction. Distributing the two, I now have six electrons. Two times four is eight hydrogens, two permanganates, and two manganese oxides. And then two times two is four waters. Did everything right? Oh. So that's step six. Three more to go. So what is step seven? Combine them. Good. So we're going to take these reactions, we're going to add them. When we do that, what will cancel? Good. Those six electrons will cancel, and then we'll just write everything else. And the law students ask me, does it matter what order you write it in? Honestly, it does not. It doesn't matter as long as you keep track of what's a reactant and what's a product. But I usually like to write the hydrogens on the far end, especially in a reaction like this, which is basic, because that's what we're going to have to get rid of in a second. So I'm going to write the eight hydrogens plus six on the minus plus two permanganate. Your step seven. Two more to go. Because we are in a basic solution, we've got these extra steps that we only have in basic solution. What was step eight if you're in a basic solution? Good. Good. Add hydroxides to cancel out the hydrogen ions. So I have eight hydrogen ions. So how many hydroxides am I going to add over here? Eight hydroxides. Because I'm now a full equation, anything I do onto one side, I must do to the other. So I'm going to also add eight hydroxides over here. Now, these eight hydrogens and eight hydroxides on the product or reactant side are going to add up to make eight waters. So what is going to be step number nine? Cancel out extra waters made. So how many waters are going to cancel? Four. I've got four on my product side, so this number eight is going to go down to four. So now I have four waters, and then I'll write everything else, plus six I minus, plus two permanganates goes to I minus plus. You're right. I should do I too. And that one. Two M N O two. 
two, and I'm left with eight hydroxides. And there's your final finished answer. Now to save space, since I had limited space on the slides here, I kind of did multiple steps on the same lines instead of rewriting the equation each time. If you look on page 880 where it shows this equation fully worked out, it breaks it down and shows you what the equation looks like at the end of each step, which is helpful when you're learning how to do it. It's also helpful if you do it that way on your test because if you don't get the final answer right and I'm going to try and figure out where things went wrong and which, how much extra how much partial credit you deserve, it's easier if I can tell this, which step something went wrong on. But to make it all fit on one paper, that's why I did it this way instead of rewriting it each time. So it's step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, step six, step seven, step eight, and then step nine. Any questions about that? All right, I'll let that concept marinate and we'll move on to a little bit of math. <laughs> All right, so section two, galvanic cells. So this is electrochemistry after all, so it's gonna be dealing with electricity. Well, I'm transferring electrons, and we generally consider the flow of electrons to be electricity. And we can measure that in different ways. So what I have set up here is a galvanic cell. A galvanic cell is a setup where you have an oxidation and a reduction taking place in separate chambers, but electrons are allowed to flow between the two chambers through something called a salt bridge. So a salt bridge, shown right here, is some sort of aqueous bridge that is full of salt solution that allows, because it's an electrolyte salt solution, allows electrons to transfer through, but does not allow anything else to transfer through here. So in this case, what I have is I have zinc solution and copper solution. And this right here, this strip of metal right here is a zinc strip of metal. And that piece of metal, pretty obvious because you can see it, is clearly copper. And then down here in the solutions, this contains zinc 2 plus, and this solution contains copper 2 plus. So this was the classic redox reaction that we started off last time with in chapter four when we first learned about redox reactions was the oxidation reduction reaction between zinc and copper, where zinc got oxidized by copper 2 plus ions. Now, in this case, it was transferring two electrons. Because now I'm having them take place in separate containers, those electrons must be transferred by moving across that salt bridge. Now, looking at this reaction, which direction are these electrons going to move? From the zinc to the copper or from the copper back to the zinc? Which one is losing electrons, zinc or copper? Zinc. Zinc is losing electrons. What thing is gaining electrons? Copper, which means in this little salt bridge, are the, reaction, are the electrons moving to the right or to the left? Which way are the electrons flowing? Right or to the left? To the right, because they're going from zinc to copper. So electrons are flowing in this direction like that, across the salt bridge. Now, if the electrons are flowing across that, we now have electricity. We can measure that electricity by measuring the voltage potential between these two. And in this case, hook it up to a voltmeter and you're measuring 1.10 volts as the potential across this. So we're gonna calculate exactly what these potentials should be and then we're gonna do all sorts of things like what happens if you change the concentrations of these, what happens if you switch them, all those other things is what we'll be doing for the majority of chapter 19. So, some terminology, anode versus cathode. We've heard these terms before, right? 
Where do you hear the terms anode and cathode run around a lot? Batteries. batteries, right? Positive end, negative end. Even if you don't know the word anode and cathode, you know it matters which end of the battery you put facing up, right? <laughs> Same idea with a galvanic cell, which, by the way, a galvanic cell is technically a liquid battery. This is how batteries work. So by definition, an anode is where the oxidation occurs, and the cathode is where the reduction occurs. So there's a couple of different ways, if you want to look them up, of how to remember these. I remember them as vowels go together and consonants go together. So anode, oxidation, there's your vowels. Cathode, reduction, there's your consonants. That's just how I remember them. So in the reaction that we just saw here, which one was getting oxidized, the zinc or the, cath or the copper? What got oxidized, zinc or copper here? What is losing electrons here, zinc or copper? Zinc's losing electrons. So is the zinc right here, is this going to be our cathode or our anode? Anode, good, because this is where the oxidation occurs. This is our anode, and over here, copper is going to be our, cath our cathode, because that's where reduction. Each separate half is called a half cell, because at each cell, half the reaction occurs. In the zinc half is where the oxidation half reaction occurs. In the, the copper cell, that is where the reduction half reaction occurs. So therefore, each one is called a half cell, or half cell, because half the reaction occurs there. That one, I already explained, the salt bridge is allowing the electrons to flow through them. So the cell potential, this is that 1.10 volts that we were measuring across, but now we're going to figure out how to calculate it. The cell potential is the E sub cell, and this is going to be the electric potential difference between the cathode and anode. So if you would just put zinc on both sides of the exact same concentration, nothing would have happened because there's no difference between them. So you would have ended up measuring no voltage across them. So you have to have some sort of potential difference between the two of them. And the difference in them is going to be what you measure is the voltage, and that is going to be your E standard cell. Now the way we generally write this notation-wise is we generally write the half cell that is your oxidation, in this case this is going to be a zinc half cell that consists of that solid zinc strip and then a one molar zinc solution and then the reduction half cell. So in that case that was going to be our copper solution and then the copper solid. So basically we just took that half reaction or that reaction and just write it out as the two separate half cells. So this is just the notation. That's the introduction to galvanic cells. And then the next section we'll actually be calculating with them. Ah. Section three, standard reduction potential. So putting some numbers to these things. So first of all, we need to have some sort of baseline, some sort of thing that we define as, OK, this is 0. And in that case, with electrochemistry and galvanic cells, we're going to make our baseline something called a standard hydrogen electron, or SHE, standard hydrogen electrode. A standard hydrogen electrode is how much potential is measured when you have hydrogen ions being reduced to make hydrogen gas, and you keep everything standard. So the hydrogen ions, which are usually provided by a strong acid, usually hydrochloric. So when I say one molar HCl, chlorine is just a spectator ion, and this is really just one molar of H plus ions. And then hydrogen gas is also going to be standard, so we're going to keep that at one atmosphere. So basically, we're comparing hydrogen to itself in solution versus in gas form. So I'm being reduced to form the hydrogen gas, and at the same time, it is being oxidized to go back to being hydrogen. Now I'm going to use a platinum electrode. Anybody idea why I would put platinum in there instead of, say, zinc? Why would I not stick zinc into this hydrochloric acid? And if you remember from last semester, we put zinc in hydrochloric acid. It, 
it dissolved. Well, it dissolved because it turned the zinc into what? This is the reaction that we collected the hydrogen up from that. So zinc would get oxidized by the hydrogen ion. So we need some sort of metal that is not going to get oxidized by um, uh, the, the hydrochloric acid. So we need a very, very low oxidizing metal. And platinum is one of the lowest we have. It's also one of the most expensive. But that's why we generally use a platinum electrode. So here I have, this is an electrolysis chamber right here. but. These little electrodes right here, you can kind of see this little tiny strip of metal right here. That's actually platinum right there, that little strip of metal. And there's one on each side, which we'll use these next class when we get to electrolysis. All right, so when we measure the potential against this, we're going to call this our zero point. So we're going to say that the electric potential of this system is zero voltage. That is our baseline meaning everything else, we are going to determine its potential as it compares to hydrogen. So when we measure the potential of copper, we're comparing it to hydrogen. When we measure the potential of zinc, we're comparing it to hydrogen. Once we get those numbers, then we can compare them to each other to calculate what the potential difference is between zinc and copper. So let's see. Here's the two ones where we are finding out their standard potential. So I have zinc compared to that standard hydrogen electrode and I measure a potential difference of 0.76. So the potential for zinc is going to be 0.76. I do the same thing for copper, and I get 0.34. Now, notice I've switched places about which side of the picture I put the standard hydrogen electrode on. This is kind of symbolic. It does not really matter which one's on the right and which left. But what's changing is which one gets oxidized and which one gets reduced. So which one is the cathode and which one is the anode? Back in chapter four, we had a table of um, oxidation potentials. And we saw, well, they didn't have numbers, but they were just breaking them in order of which one's most likely to be oxidized. Anything that was above the hydrogen could be oxidized by hydrogen. Anything below what could be reduced by hydrogen. Let me pull up that table real quick show you. I don't remember what it looked like. On page 149. This thing. The pink line was the hydrogen. Everything above hydrogen could be oxidized by hydrogen, so zinc is up there. Anything below hydrogen cannot be oxidized by hydrogen, but it can be reduced by hydrogen, and copper is down there. So copper would be reduced by the standard hydrogen electrode, so it would be the cathode in that galvanic cell. While zinc can be oxidized by the standard hydrogen electrode, so it is going to be the anode in that galvanic cell. And why is it important to care about what's the cathode versus what is the anode? And that is because when you add these two reactions together, so for example, let's look at the zinc versus the standard hydrogen electrode. So the zinc is going to be the anode, so it's getting oxidized, so the electrons are coming off on the product side, whereas the hydrogen is going to be getting reduced, so that's going to be our cathode here. When we add these together and we get the overall reaction to determine the E cell of the overall reaction, it's the cathode minus the anode. So here is our first formula of the chapter. The E standard of a cell is equal to whatever your potential is for the cathode minus what your potential is for the anode. So in this case, we've determined that our hydrogen was getting reduced, so that's our cathode. And that's a standard hydrogen electrode, which we define as our zero point. So zero is our cathode. And then our, hydro our, our zinc, we measured its standard potential using a voltmeter to be 0.76 right here, volts. So that's going to be, this number is going to be 0.76. So 0 minus 0.76 gives us negative 0.76 as the standard potential for zinc. If you're following along, we're currently on page 885. Now, if I did the exact same thing for copper to figure out what the standard potential difference is for copper, 
So copper, I measured 0.34. But now, what is getting oxidized? Is it the copper or the hydrogen? What's getting oxidized? Hydrogen, which means the hydrogen is going to be my anode, and the copper is going to be my cathode. If the E standard of the cell is the cathode minus the anode, I'm just going to write cath minus anode, or cathode, sure, minus anode. And my anode here is the standard hydrogen electron road, so that's zero. It's going to be 0.34 minus zero, so copper will have a standard potential of positive 0.34 volts compared to our zinc that ended up being negative. So it matters whether or not you're going to be oxidized or reduced by hydrogen will determine whether or not your standard potential ends up being negative or positive. All right, let's try this out. A galvanic cell consists of a magnesium electrode in one molar magnesium nitrate and a cadmium electrode in one molar cadmium nitrate solution. Determine the overall cell reaction and calculate the cell potential at 25 degrees Celsius. Now, those numbers that I showed you, the 0.76 for the um, zinc and the 0.34 for copper, we need to find those numbers, and we have a table on page 887. Clearly one I mark often because I've got a tab there. So on page 887, this looks very similar to that table in chapter 4 that I just saw, showed you. In fact, the hydrogen is still written in pink in this table. It's still pointed out, here's hydrogen, meaning everything that is below it is going to be reduced by hydrogen. Everything above it is going to be oxidized, and you can see that in the potel cell potential differences. Everything below it is going to have a negative. Everything above it is going to have a positive. So if we look up for the magnesium and the cadmium in that table, magnesium is going to be negative 2.37 and cadmium is going to be negative 0 0.40 volts. So next, we have to figure out, well, what's going to be um, oxidized and what's going to be reduced between magnesium and cadmium? If we look at that table, do I have the table open? Screen. Do, 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 do. I didn't put the table up here. That's annoying. I'll just hold it up. Let's see. Find where magnesium is and where cadmium is real quick. Three. And then cadmium is 4. Let's do this in pencil. All right. So there is magnesium and there is cadmium. So magnesium is lower on the table. And on the table it says as you go down, you are increasing in uh, strength as a reducing agent. Now, is a reducing agent what gets reduced or what, do, what does the reduction? The reducing agent, is that what gets reduced or what does the reduction? does the reduction, which good, which means the reducing agent doesn't get reduced, it gets what? Oxidized. So looking at magnesium versus cadmium, magnesium is lower, so it's higher in strength as a reducing agent, meaning more likely to be oxidized. So magnesium will get oxidized, cadmium will get reduced. Quick and easy way to think of that is the thing that's lower on the table is what will get oxidized which is completely the opposite of the table in chapter four. Isn't that fun? So magnesium will get oxidized. So if magnesium is getting oxidized, does that make it the cathode or the anode? Anode, good. So magnesium with its negative 2.37 potential is going to be your anode here. And then cadmium with your negative 0.4 is going to be your cathode. So Patel cell potential difference is cathode minus anode. So cathode minus anode is going to be that negative 0.4 for the cathode. I'll write it up here, E standard of the cell. And then we'll balance it. Cathode is negative 0.40. 
minus the anode, and the anode is negative 2.37. So what is your overall, let me get both volts, what is your overall potential of the cell? Good, positive, because two negative to negative positive, positive 1.97 volts is your E standard of the cell. Now to figure out the overall reaction, these reactions as written, and by the way, these two reactions are, where do, we just got those straight off the table. You don't have to come up with them on your own. This is just exactly as it is written on that table on page 887. So those are the half reactions written there. Are these oxidations or reductions as written? As is written there, are these both oxidation reactions or reduction reactions as they're written? Good reduction. They're both gaining electrons. So they're both written as reduction reactions in that table where these came from. But what got oxidized? What do we say was getting oxidized? Magnesium or cadmium? Magnesium, which means I need to take this reaction for magnesium and make it an oxidation. So how do I make, turn this reduction into an oxidation? Good, just flip it. So I'm just going to rewrite this as magnesium goes to magnesium 2 plus plus 2 electrons. So mag now it's an oxidation. Magnesium goes to magnesium 2 plus and 2 electrons. I can leave cadmium the same. At that point, it's the three-step method. But in this reaction, both of them have two electrons, so they'll cancel. And there's your overall cell reaction. And this is the same problem on page 889. So back in chapter four, when we were looking at that table of um, oxidizing ability, we used it to predict whether or not reactions will occur. We can do the same thing with our table that we now have on page 887. Notice this table is much, much longer than the table we had in chapter four. Because the table we had in chapter four just had metals on it, plus hydrogen. This thing's got stuff on it that's not metals. Most of the metals are shown down at the bottom because metals are more likely to be oxidized by hydrogen. But up top here, we have metals and we also have non-metals. We even have a couple of polyatomic ions thrown in there for fun. So when the same rules apply, just the table is flipped, things down below are more likely to be um, reduced, things up high are more likely to be oxidized. So now we're going to, sorry, things down low are more likely to be oxidized, things up high are more likely to be reduced. So you can only get oxidized by something that is higher on you on, than the table. So all of these metals down here below hydrogen can get oxidized by hydrogen. Any metals above it, such as copper, cannot be oxidized by hydrogen. They would be reduced. So we're going to use that idea to determine if the following reactions will occur as written or not. So predict what reacts, redox reaction will take place, if any, when we add molecular bromine, Br2, to the following, a one molar solution of sodium iodide or a one molar solution of sodium chloride, assuming both of them are standard temperature. So here are the potentials that we pulled off of the table on page 887. So bromine, positive 1.07, iodide, positive 0.53, and then chlorine, 1.36. Now, I didn't put sodium in there because he's just going to be a spectator for our purposes right now. We're just worrying about what can bromine do to iodide or to chlorine. So first, let's look at iodine versus chlorine. Now, if I'm starting with mole molecular bromine, that means this reaction must occur as written. We can't flip bromine and say, oh, well, we're going to have bromine be oxidized. Bromine can't be oxidized because I'm not starting off with bromide ion. I'm starting off with molecular bromine. So this reaction must take place in the forward direction, which means I'm going to compare these two reactions to it 
by flipping them and saying, okay, these two are going to be the ones that get oxidized. So again, the rule is you can only be oxidized by something that is lower than you on the table. Now, I've got the table in front of me, but here I've given you the numbers. So how can you tell from the numbers what's going to be higher or lower on the table? On the table, as you go down the table, this potential is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where once you pass hydrogen, it actually becomes negative. So the highest potential differences are high on the table. The lowest potential differences are low on the table. So based off of that, is iodide higher or lower than bromine? Lower, because its number is lower. So can iodide be oxidized by bromine? Yes, so that reaction will occur. Can chlorine be oxidized by bromine? No, if you look at its potential difference, its potential is higher, therefore it is higher on the table, therefore it is less likely to be oxidized, and therefore bromine will not be able to oxidize chlorine as written. So bromine will be able to oxidize iodide. That reaction will occur. And if you want to write the half reaction, just take the iodine reaction, flip it because it's not an oxidation, and add it to the bromine. But the chlorine reaction will not occur because chlorine has a higher standard potential, meaning it is more likely to be reduced, not oxidized, than bromine. How are we doing? Job and ourselves. So let's talk about a term we used a whole lot back in chapter 18 last week. If a reaction will occur, we call that being what? Spontaneous. If a reaction will not occur, we call that? Non-spontaneous. So the next section is going to be taking these galvanic cells and these redox reactions and determining whether or not they're going to be spontaneous under standard state conditions here. So we're going to, still working around with these terms, we need to get some way to get between the energy units that we know, which are joules, and trying and get to the units that we, that we use with energy for Potential, it's voltage. What is our unit for charge, though? That's a charge unit, but when we measure how much charge is on something, what is the SI unit for charge? C. C stands for what? Charge. <laughs> what unit, though? <laughs> Coulombs. Um, Remember that? Coulomb. So the Coulomb is a unit of charge, voltage is a unit of potential. And if you put those two together, you will get a unit of energy, which is joules. All right. So one joule is equal to one Coulomb times one volt. Now, we're going to then put this in terms of electrons. Now, electrons, there's going to be a lot of them, so we're going to count them in moles. So we're going to use a term F, which is a farad, a farad, or the, so F, the Faraday's constant is 96,500 coulombs per mole of electrons. So if I measure out a mole of electrons, it will have a collective charge of 96,500 coulombs. So this is Faraday's constants. It's commonly just used as a unit, units of farads or Faraday's, and it just corresponds to a mole of electrons, or what the charge would be on a mole of electrons. So we're on page 891 here. So when we measure the cell potential of a galvanic cell, that is the maximum amount of voltage that we can, occur, we can get out of that cell. We can calculate this using the Faraday's constant the standard potential of the cell, and then what is N again? Moles, so that's going to be our moles, N. So if we took the, with this in terms of spontaneity, what state function tells us straight up, without a doubt, is the reaction going to be spontaneous or not? If delta G is negative, good. So delta G is our Gibbs free energy. If it is negative, you are spontaneous. No 
you know, maybe at high temperature. No, if G, delta G is negative, you are definitely spontaneous. So delta G can be calculated using negative NFE cell, which if we're dealing with the standard cells, as we just did, so delta G standard will be negative N, your number of moles, times F, Faraday's constant, times E standard of the cell. Now, we also talked about spontaneity in terms of, well, they jumped ahead to an example. We don't have time for an example today. All right. So on Wednesday, we will pick up right here and start with this example using that equation we just circled to solve this sample problem.